Okay, so welcome everyone. I hope everyone is well. It's uh, been a long time since we've been together and uh, not much has changed. Um, we are all mostly still stuck at home and, um, and grateful to the technological wizardry of uh, the 21st century and uh, David Haas um, for uh, enabling us to be together. I'm sure many of you uh, <clears throat> experienced the high holy days on uh, Zoom and thought it was um, um, a um, very successful substitute for the real I, thing. I don't have a problem. Um, and uh, anyway, so the first thing I want to say, <clears throat> although I don't think we have Sheldon's attention, is that I um, inadvertently scheduled this class from 1030 to 12 when I meant to schedule it from 1030 to 1130. <clears throat> so maybe, Valerie, you won't have to leave early. <clears throat> and if somebody would remind me, or I'll try to remember, I will repeat that again later because everybody's just coming in. Um, okay, so I must admit that I know that all of you have been in one class or another that I was teaching last semester, but I'm not 100% sure whether all of you were in this class and studying Talmud. I, 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 I'm not sure, Jean, you were in the, I was in your in the class. Bible class. No, I was in the class from 1030. From, uh, from the Talmud class or the, the Genesis class? Oh, I was in the Genesis class, right out, right, right Rabbi. So that's Tuesday mornings. Oh, OK. Well, if you don't mind. You're, no, welcome, no. To st you're welcome to stay. Thank you. And decide. And you'll see whether or not you want to stay with us. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, Jonathan Stoller is just joining us, and I'm pretty sure he was not in the Talmud class last year. Correct. Right. So, um, so what do I do about that? Okay. Um, so I don't know exactly where those of us who were in the class left off, but luckily it doesn't matter in the Talmud. Um, the rabbis, as many of you may be aware, refer to the Talmud as a yam, a sea. Uh, and you can jump into the sea at almost any point and pick it up and start swimming. And the fact that you don't know what happened a few minutes ago, or in this case, a few pages ago, doesn't have a tremendous impact on what you're studying at the moment. So we're going to just pick it up where I've decided to pick it up. We are still in chapter one of uh, Barachot, blessings. <clears throat> for those of you who are, sorry about my voice. <clears throat> for those of you who are new to this, let me just give you a quick introduction. Um, <clears throat> not as extensive as I might. Um, <clears throat> so we're reading a text called the Talmud, which is actually made up of two texts together. Uh, one is the Mishnah, which was created in Hebrew around the beginning of the third century B, uh, CE, right, around the year 200, written in Hebrew and, in, and written in the land of Israel, um, and, uh, and structured as a systematic <clears throat> code of Jewish law covering the entirety, uh, the entire spectrum of Jewish law um, as it was understood to have existed in the second temple period. So in a sense, the Mishnah is a monument to second century and first century temple Judaism. Right? With that said, it also includes and really introduces elements 
um, <clears throat> which allow the transition from a temple-based Judaism to a home or synagogue-based Judaism. Home slash synagogue, the distinction between the two <clears throat> is still um, uh, is still uh, evolving, right? At the early part of the Mishnah. <clears throat> so the um, the materials that make up the Mishnah, uh, for the most part, were created in the centuries preceding uh, the, the editing of the Mishnah during the period when even while the temple stood, the centrality of a temple-based religion had lost its power. Um, that's maybe too negative a way to say it. Maybe a more positive way to say it is that it didn't satisfy a growing need for individual involvement in religious life. And so even as the temple stood, a, a group of scholars whom we now call the rabbis, but who were not called the rabbis at the time that the Mishnah was first written, uh, but may have been called the sages or the Pharisees, uh, this group uh, began to create a home slash synagogue based religion that was really initially understood to exist while the temple was in existence. But with the destruction of the temple, the um, structure that these sages had begun to lay out really inherited and became what was left of Judaism, right? Um, there are all kinds of other things that I could get into in terms of the um, history of the Mishnah, but I'll hold off on that for a minute and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to touch base with them as we go forward. So we have this text called the Mishnah. It's written in Israel edited in Israel after the destruction of the temple, collecting materials mostly from before the um, um, destruction of the temple. And um, 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 uh, and, and really um, acting as a substitute for the temple after the destruction. The Talmud, or more, more accurately known as the Gemara, is a second text written in Aramaic, mostly, or 98%, I'm going to say, composed by Jews in Babylonia after the destruction of the temple and after the expulsion of the majority of Jews from Israel. So the Talmud's problem, as it were, is to take the Mishnah and to try to apply it and expand it to cover a burgeoning Jewish life now a couple of hundred years removed from the existence of a temple in Jerusalem, right? So the Mishnah is edited in the year 200. The Talmud begins to be created immediately following. It spans the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, possibly seventh, some scholars say eighth, and some really radical scholars say ninth century. Mm -hmm. So it's hundreds of years 
of commentary on, co uh, uh, on top of commentary, finally edited sometime in the seventh or eighth century to resembling probably the text we have now. Um, and whereas the Mishnah edit is ed editorial process is credited to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the um, most senior of official, let's say, of Pharisaic Judaism in the beginning of the third century, uh, the, the, the editing of the Talmud has no uh, as, um, a name ascribed to it. It's all anonymous. Okay? So that's just to sort of situate ourselves in time. Um, as I said last year, there are a, a variety of ways of trying, of reading the Talmud. The one that is most common and yet also the one that is most misinformed is to think of the Talmud as a book of law. In fact, there are, whereas the Mishnah is a code of law, the Talmud in arguing and interpreting the Mishnah rarely comes to a legal decision but rather is an ongoing series of conversations about the law. Conversations that um, generate not only law or legal arguments, but also folk tales, what we might call theology, questions of belief, questions of um, manners, questions of ethics, questions sometimes of magic, um, recipes, um, health tips, everything that might end up finding its way into a conversation. Um, trying to ascertain who the Talmud was addressed to, what its purpose was understood to be by its authors and editors, is in my opinion still an almost totally unanswered and unanswerable question, right? So one of my secret hopes is that someday in teaching cl enough classes like this, I will somehow get a hint as to what the Talmud is all about. <laughs> but, um, but so far I haven't. Okay, so um, I could go on and talk about this. I I I'm gonna stop here. I know this is very rudimentary and maybe a little confusing, but I want to just see if anybody has a specific question or, or something that's on their mind vis-a-vis. -vis. Let me just end by saying, therefore, okay, therefore, what, we're, what we have in front of us and call the Talmud is two texts juxtaposed. The Mishnah, which serves as the catalyst for the ongoing conversations and interpretations of a second text called the Gemara. And the Mishnah and the Gemara together are traditionally called the Talmud. Although sometimes you can refer to the Talmud and mean the Gemara, we're going to try to, for, for clarity's sake, we're gonna to try to distinguish. So when we're reading Mishnah, we'll call it Mishnah. When we're reading Gemara, we'll call it Gemara, right? And where we're gonna to begin today is in the Gemara. I will remind us briefly to begin with what the Mishnah was that spurred this conversation. But those of you who were here last year know that we spent almost the whole year, and I think we covered about six pages of Talmudic discussion. Mm -hmm. Some of it being very complex, some of it being very difficult to follow, some of it being very, very far removed from the initial question of what the Mishnah was about, 
And so we're going to dive back into the Gemara um, and we're going to try to carry along with us those people who are new. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask for questions or comments. Jean? Yes, uh, Rabbi, is there what I would call an authorized text? Uh, yes. Based on different interpret, not based on different interpretations, based on different differences in translation. Okay, so there are two questions that you're raising. Um, is there an authorized text of the Talmud? The answer is yes. Um, now, throughout the Middle Ages, when the Talmud was being written and recent and and and, and really still in formation, and then in the centuries after it had become generally fixed, there were, of course, different manuscripts with, with a, a variety of, um, of, of differences. But in um, the, um, I didn't expect this question, so I didn't look up dates, Jean, but I can do that for you next time. But uh, around the, the uh, the six, sometime in the 16th century, I believe, after the advent of printing in uh, Venice, the first edition, printed edition of the Talmud was, well, actually the first printed edition of the Talmud was in Italy in the 15th century. Oh my God. It's called the Sansino edition not to be confused with the Sensino translation of today, the Sensi, which is named after a publishing house called the Sensino Press. But in the original Sensino, Sensino was actually a place. So the Sensino edition of the Talmud, but that edition of the Talmud was then reorganized and published in Venice again, sometime in the late 15th century, 1500s, um, uh, or late, late early 1500s. And that edition of the Talmud with its pagination and everything is the standard edition of the Talmud to this day. Okay, so now if you're a scholar of Talmud, there are other manuscripts you can you can look at to, to, make, to critique the printed edition. <clears throat> but in all Talmudic discourse, the, the, the Talmud is um, 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 is, is standardized. Even in editions of the Talmud, which are printed in a different way today, they will still have the page of the Venetia Talmud on the, in the corner so that everybody knows what page they're on, okay? So the answer to your question is yes, there is an authorized edition of the Talmud in the original. Now, the second part of your question, is there an authorized translation? And the answer to that, of course, is no, oh. right? So there are a couple of translations. Uh, the Talmud consists of, a pro of 20, massive Hebrew volumes. So a full English translation of the Talmud is a massive undertaking mm -hmm. and has only been done a few times. One is the one I mentioned earlier, the Sensino edition of the Talmud, um, which up until a few years ago was the standard and really the only complete English edition. Um, Today we have two others that are much better, much more accurate. One is the art scroll edition of the Talmud. And the second is the Steinzoltz edition of the Talmud in English. Um, those who were in my class last year received as a bonus from me, since I happen to have about 10 volumes of this art scroll Talmud tractate brachot available, I gave them out. So some of you have the art scroll Talmud and um, that's for your learning pleasure. Uh, those of you who might be interested in buying your own copy of the Talmud, um, 
You can buy them one volume at a time. And we're going to be studying the tractate called Barachot, which is the first tractate of the Talmud. If anybody is so moved, I would advise getting either of those Steinzolds. Um, but probably I would, I would recommend the Art Scroll more, only because it's a little easier to maneuver within. Um, we're going to be using a translation that I'm going to put on the screen in a moment, which comes from a website called Safaria, which is a, another one of those miracles of the current digital age in which an extraordinary treasury of Jewish texts has been made available in translation. The translation is, that we're using is called the William Davidson translation. I'm actually not familiar with that translation other than seeing it on Safaria, so I can't really compare it, but it seems to me to be quite, quite sufficient for our purposes, okay? Was there another question, Phyllis? Uh, what's known as the Babylonian Talmud, is that just the Gemara? Uh, well, <laughs> if you said Babylonian Gemara, yes, it would be the Babylonian Gemara. Once you, when you, once you say Babylonian Talmud, then you mean by definition, the Babylonian Gemara with the Mishnah, right? Now, you raise a good point that I forgot to mention, so I'll say it quickly. Uh, the process of creating the Talmud uh, yielded, for lack of a better word, two similar but different recensions. One is called the Babylonian Talmud and the other is called the Jerusalem Talmud or the Talmud of the land of Israel because the process of commenting and, and critiquing the Mishnah by the rabbis of the second, third, and fourth, and fifth centuries went on both in yeshivot in Israel and in yeshivot in Babylonia. And they created two different kinds of texts, similar in style, but different. The so-called Jerusalem Talmud was essentially lost and then resurfaced in around the year 1000, maybe 900. Um, and so the Babylonian Talmud was initially the only Talmud and it became the authoritative Talmud and it remains the authoritative Talmud, not only because it was the first, but also because the Babylonian Jewish community lived in much more peaceful and affluent circumstances and the process of actually crafting the Talmud into a literary document proceeded much more successfully in Babylonia than it did in Israel. So some, in some ways you could imagine that Israel, the Jerusalem Talmud as being a, a less well edited, a less literate, less literary, um, Talmud than the Babylonian one. These are issues that are way beyond our pay grade. So I'm not going to go into them in any more detail than that. But you're right in pointing out that there are these two, quote unquote, two Talmuds. The one we're studying is, of course, the Babylonian Talmud. Okay. Any other questions? Jonathan. Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me. I actually have a more personal um, type question, Rabbi Stone, and it has to do with um, um, our purpose for studying Talmud and what I might be able to realistically expect from studying um, Talmud. So if I join a Musar class, I know that this is a place where I can work on myself, hopefully to be a better person and to be sharing that community. This is, this is a little different. So it's clear to me this is a wonderful intellectual exercise. It's a wonderful um, opportunity to, be, to study together with others, um, to learn of the lineage. I'm wondering though, from your perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, um, whether this should also be seen as an opportunity for, or I should expect to 
become a better person, gain insights? Is it going to make my day better on that sense? Um, yeah, if, as, a, as a newbie, if, if you could address that issue, I'd appreciate it. That is a fabulous question, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, so let me answer it this way, keeping in mind that I'm thinking on my feet. Um, number one, the Judaism that we know, with all of its richness and its ethics, its way of looking at the world, is based primarily on the insights and work of two really unique and phenomenal moments in history. One is obviously the writers who created and crafted the Torah. Um, and the Torah remains, of course, the bedrock of Jewish consciousness. And the Torah itself, or let's say the Tanakh itself, the whole Bible, um, has an evolutionary arc. And that evolutionary arc moves from the experience of Israel in the wilderness to include a kind of revision of that experience on the basis of prophetic literature, wherever that comes from, whatever that, however that came about. It includes a, a history of Israel uh, and it includes a variety of independent works that we call the wisdom literature. Um, and taken all together, as it were, it, it, it's, its way of understanding itself is as the working of the voice of God through human beings, hmm. right? So from the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible, we have human beings um, delivering, for lack of a better word, insights into the world which they claim or which they understand to be given to them by God. And if you look at the first century where the temple was destroyed, this process of God-given prophetic, poetic narrative in the land of, in the people, amongst the people of Israel, continues past the end of our biblical canon and it morphs into being the canon that we now call the New Testament, right? So if you compare the New Testament so-called with the old so-called, the structure is the same, right? The New Testament is a um, quintessential development of Israelite thought and literary tradition. It could not have come anywhere but from Israel. However, at the same time that the New Testament was continuing the prophetic mode of the Old Testament, um, the group that we know as the rabbis um, <clears throat> responding in part, I think, to the tragedies of the destruction of the temple, 
um, initiated a new kind of discourse which broke with the prophetic tradition um, and asked all kinds of new questions. And most importantly, included much more emphasis on the role of human beings in fashioning this new world view than the role of God. Mm. And this new worldview then spoke through not intuitive emanations of the divine, but rather human intellect being applied to the already existing text. Now, there are all kinds of reasons for this, and I'm giving a very cursory explanation. Obviously, one reason is the, rabbin the rabbinic rejection of the Jesus story, <clears throat> and the Jesus story becomes the main focus of the New Testament. But, but, but even besides that, the rabbis coupled the destruction of the temple <clears throat> with the cessation of prophecy, right? Without a temple, there could be no more prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, that, and, and therefore they needed a new, or they created a new type of discourse one that was more dependent on human intellect. And so they created this second literature, which becomes the successor to the Bible. And with the Bible becomes the fulcrum out of which Jewish existence will emerge. So, what do we get by studying Talmud? One, we get an, an experience and an introduction into the thought of the rabbinic mind, if one can call it that. We encounter the changing values of rabbinic civilization versus biblical civilization we encounter a religion that is much less focused on um, uh, temple ritual and much more focused on human um, and, and communal ritual. Um, and, and here's where it gets kind of theological. The rabbis, and I, you know, there are so many rabbis and they span so many centuries that that's always a very loaded term. But nonetheless, well, rabbinic civilization, let's call it, substituted the act of studying biblical texts as a mode of achieving atonement and salvation hmm. for temple ritual. So this was the big debate theologically in the first century. Without a temple, how can the Jew achieve atonement? How can a Jew put oneself right with God? I mean, after all, that was the purpose of the temple. You went to the temple and you were forgiven if you went through the ritual. And of course, if you went through it, with your full heart. But without a temple, what could you do? Well, one group of Jews answered that question by saying, it's okay. We have another sacrifice. It's the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And now all we have to do is reimagine that sacrifice as part of our religious ritual, right? By offering the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, just as the sacrificial animal was offered body and blood on the altar. Another group of Israelites, let's call them, uh, said no, right? There are all kinds of reasons why they said no, we don't have to get into that. 
They said, no, instead, all we can do is study the text. Study becomes the substitute and the way of worship, really. The origin of worship in the uh, post-temple world was study. Before there was liturgy, before there was prayer. So on the one hand, studying Talmud is trying to imagine how such study can function as a form of worship and lead to a sense of achieving some level of atonement or salvation. Equivalent to the kind of mystical sense that one might get if one were able to offer a sacrifice. So that's, I think, reason number one. Reason number two, of course, is that it's a, it's a treasury, right? Almost everything we know and have in contemporary Jewish life somehow has been shaped by or influenced by or emerges from Talmud of Judaism, including, by the way, Jonathan Musar. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So, uh, is that enough for today? Or that's that's exquisite. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, what I'm going to do is put up a text, and we're just going to dive in. We have uh, about 20 minutes left. Let me just repeat for those of you who joined us late that uh, we're gonna be starting every week at 10.30, but we're only going to 11.30. I made a mistake. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean for this to go on to noon. Um, it, it gets a little heavy. And I think an hour and a half would uh, make us all cross-eyed. Okay. So. All right. So um, we're gonna get into this text. Where are, where are we? Um, we're going to go to um, Barachot. Uh, Barachot. What am I doing here? This is where we began last year. This is the Mishnah. So I'm just, I just want to situate us. <laughs> this Mishnah, now, the, the, the Mishnah is divided into six sections called orders. Each order covers, generally speaking, one subject matter. The first is called, um, the first order is called Zra'im, seeds. And it covers mostly agricultural law. The second is Moed, which covers special times like festivals and Shabbat. Uh, The third is called uh, the Zikin damages, covers civil and criminal jurisprudence. Um, There's one called, the next one is called Nashim, women, which covers mostly marriage and divorce law. And then the, there are two more that cover mostly temple ritual and purity laws, right? So the first one of all is called, uh, and, and out of these six orders, there are t- approximately, um, I'm going to say, 50 to 60 track, individual tractates on more specific subjects. The first tractate is called Brachot blessings, right? And we could get off on a tangent as to why that is the case. Um, Obviously, agricultural law has to do with food, brachot. I mean, there's really no good way to understand why brachot is first. So we'll just say it is, right? So the first Mishnah of the first tractate of the first order is from when 
does one recite the Shema in the evening? Right? So obviously the Mishnah presumes that you know what the Shema is. It actually already presumes that you know you're supposed to recite it. It already presumes that you're supposed to say it twice a day. Um, and it even presumes that you, you know that the, the day begins in the evening and not the morning. And therefore the first uh, subject of the Shema should be the evening Shema. Lots of presuppositions. These presuppositions are important because the rabbis, uh, um, the, rab the rabbinic narrative suggests or, or uh, affirms that the Torah is the written law of Judaism, but that when the written law was given, an oral law was also given to Moses to explain the intricacies of the written law. And the oral law was passed down orally from Moses all the way to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi in the second century. And the only reason he wrote it down, according to this tradition, is because there was a fear that it would be lost altogether because of the difficulty that Jews were living under in, during Roman occupation. That's the, what I would call the myth. Mm -hmm. you know? um, the principle behind this myth is, is actually quite revolutionary, right? It's, it, it is asserting, going back all the way into history, that this oral law was given at Sinai and therefore has the same authority or very close to the same authority as the law given at Sinai, right? This is in some ways what makes the rabbinic enterprise so radical. They are creating, there's no question, they are creating this material and they are, a, they are telegraphing it back to the beginning of Jewish life in mythic times and essentially ascribing it to Moshe the same way the Torah is ascribed to Moshe, right? Mm -hmm. This doctrine, the doctrine of the dual Torah, one written and one oral, becomes definitive of what it means to be a Jew. To quote unquote believe in the authenticity of the revelation, revelation at Sinai in two parts, one oral and one written. Any group that does not affirm the authority of the oral Torah is heretical. Right? And thus, for example, Christianity is heretical. It affirms the written Torah, but not the oral Torah. Mm -hmm. um, Karaitism in the 10th century is heretical because it argues that only the Torah, written Torah, is authoritative. Right. So this has been an issue that has emerged in Jewish history a number of times. The rabbinic understanding of what it means to be a Jew is to affirm both the written and oral Torah. That's why the Mishnah doesn't begin by saying you need to say the Shema or even defining what the Shema is, because it assumes you know the written Torah. And the oral Torah comes to elucidate the written Torah, right? So from when does one recite the Shema in the evening? From the time when the priests enter to partake of their Truma. Truma is that kind, that food that is set aside for the priests and which they can only eat when they are in a state of ritual purity. If by any reason they become impure, they have to leave the temple precincts, sometimes for a day, sometimes for as much as a week. And then they have to immerse in a mikvah. And then they return to the temple and they are, in a, they are able to partake of the truma. So clearly that was a particular time when they all came back together. 
And that was the symbol that one, that one could recite the Shema. Until the end of the first watch. That is, we have the minimum, that is when you can begin to say the Shema, which is at the time the priests come back, and how long you can say the Shema up until. According to one opinion in the Mishnah, it's the end of the first watch, which is approximately three hours. Um, that's according to Rabbi Eliezer. But the majority opinion of the sages is that it is until midnight. And not only that, but there is even an, a, a, an opinion by Rabbi Gamliel who says that you can, in, you can recite it until the next morning, until dawn. And then the Mishnah gives us a story that says Rabbi Gamliel's sons came back very late from a wedding. They asked him if they could still say the Shema. He said yes, because it's not yet dawn. And then the, 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 the Mishnah explains, if that's the case, why did the rabbis say midnight? And the Mishnah finally says it's in order to keep us far from transgression. Mm -hmm. If we think we have to say it by midnight, we'll try to say it by midnight. If we know we can say it until dawn, we will put it off and put it off and we'll end up sleeping through it and we won't say it at all. That is not a very in-depth conversation about this Mishnah, but I just wanted to situate ourselves. Beginning with that Mishnah, the Gemara then started to take it apart and ask various questions about why the Mishnah teaches what it does. But it asks those questions, as I've said, in a conversational style. And like any conversation, it is filled with digressions and interpolations and interruptions. Now, note, one of my theories of what the Talmud is all about is that it is precisely about the idea that thinking requires conversation. Mm. Right? That the individual person thinking in the person's individual mind is not as effective or even legitimate as ideas that are generated by human beings face-to-face -face, talking to one another. That dialogue is in some ways connected to the quote-unquote meaning of the Talmud. In which case, the content of the dialogue is not always as important as the structure. Because what we're really watching, what we're really doing is overhearing a conversation now, keep in mind, this conversation never happened. The rabbis who are depicted as speaking to one another, it will turn out, sometimes lived centuries apart. So it is the editors of the Talmud taking statements of earlier rabbis and later rabbis and weaving them into a conversational discourse that are by that, in my view, transmitting their understanding of how one achieves religious insight right? by, by and through dialogue, conversation, based of course on revelatory material, the Torah, mm -hmm. but generating off of that revelation new insights, which by definition then become part of the revelation. So it's as though God embedded within the Torah an almost infinite treasury of insight, which human beings are invited to discover through collegial conversation. Therefore, over the course of last year, we got further and further and further away 
from the subject of that Mishnah. And I'm not going to repeat all of that, or we'd be doing it over again. So we're going to take it to about where I think we left off, which is on page 6a, where I had had us before. Uh, come on. Rabbi, I think my my reference is that we finished six B. And we were gonna start seven. Okay. I got to seven eight Rabbi, I got to seven eight three. Seven eight two. Well, that is helpful, but we're going to start where I want to. Okay. <laughs> it would help. Okay. Which is a little bit more, a little bit earlier than that, so that we can sort of back, get into that. Okay. Uh, okay. So we, just got to get back to where I was. 6A1. What? Okay, here we go. What? Okay. What? So, um, for those of you who we, we may have done this last year at the end, that's fine. Those of you who didn't, then here's where we're starting. And all of the stuff that came before only leads up to it vaguely, right? So you're not missing anything. Um, it, it's, it's just part of this ongoing conversation, right? So um, Um, the, here's the Hebrew V Amar Rabbi Chelbo. And Rabbi Chelbo said that Rav Chuna said, any person who has the fear of heaven, his words are heeded, as it is stated. The end of the matter, all having been heard, fear God, which is a statement from uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. The end of the matter, all having been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is all of man. Now, in this edition of the Talmud, you'll see in the bold print is the actual translation literally from the text. In the non-bold print are editorial emendations to try to make the text read more coherently because the Talmudic text is extraordinarily stenographic, right? It does not often it often does not speak, so to speak, in full sentences, right? But rather assumes that you know what it's talking about. Um, including, as you'll see in this, in this case, that since the rabbis knew the entire Tanakh by heart, they would often quote the beginning of a verse, knowing that you could finish it, and they didn't need to. And sometimes the conversation will be about the end of the verse, which was not even in the text, rather than the part of the verse that was in the text. Right? So here we have a quote, Rabbi Chelbo, who was a rather late uh, Talmudic rabbi, in the name of Rav Chuna, who was an earlier Talmudic rabbi, who says, any person who has the fear of heaven, his words are heeded, right? And then he quotes a verse. The Talmud, the Gemara, is now going to ask, with regard to the end of this verse, which you remember wasn't even quoted, what is meant by the statement, for this is all of man? Rabbi Elazar said, the Holy One, blessed be he, said, <clears throat> 
about him, the entire world was created only for this person. This is the ultimate person for which all of man was created. Okay. Um, I'm going to read on because I want to get this argument out on the table because we're not going to have time to go through it uh, in its entirety. Um, um, okay. Um, Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana said, the end of this verse teaches this is the equivalent to the entire world. Rabbi Shimon ben Azi and some say Rabbi Shimon ben Zoma said, not only is it the equivalent, is he the equivalent of the entire world, but the entire world was created to serve as companions for him so that he would have a society in which to live, right, and interact. That's the end of this fragment conversation. Um, the next fragment begins, and when we get to it, you'll see that it's actually, it, it's, it's spurred by this first fragment, but it is not continuous. So let's take this little bit of Talmud and see if we can make some sense of it before we end, right? So we don't know at this juncture, and we don't care, why Rabbi Chelbo and Rabbi Huna brought this particular uh, digression. That's not of interest to us at the moment. All we know is that Rabbi Chelbo, in the name that the editor of the Talmud, at this juncture in the text, inserted this teaching that was traditionally handed down in the name of Rabbi Chuna by other rabbis, including Rabbi Chelbo. And that that teaching says, any person who has the fear of heaven, his words are heeded. Now, by the way, Jonathan, this is already feeds into the kind of ethical concern that will be fairly common in Talmudic discourse, right? Mm. What we want to know is um, uh. what is the consequence of living a life in fear of heaven? Keeping in mind that fear of heaven doesn't mean being merely being afraid, but really being humbled and trembling at the majesty of the divine, right? Defining, as it were, the human in relationship to the magnus majesty of the divine. Right? And in an attempt to describe the consequence of living a life in fear of heaven, one thing that here emerges is that such a person's words are believed. Mm -hmm. That if you live a life of humility in the face of the divine, then you are, you have credibility. People believe you to be telling the truth. Because if you weren't living in fear of heaven, you would be, you would, you might be a liar and it, you wouldn't care. But if you live in fear of heaven, you certainly wouldn't lie, right? So this is a very, on some level, this is a very mundane teaching that people who are truly, quote unquote, religious in the best sense of the word, people who are truly cognizant of their of living as it were in the shadow of the majesty of the divine will be very careful with their words and can be depended upon. But the rabbinic imagination is gonna take this idea and make it even bigger. By taking the end of this verse, right? Um, keep his commandments for this is all of man. And the rabbis ask, just by implication, what does that strange phrase in Ecclesiastes mean? The end of the matter, all having been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, period. That makes sense. Ecclesiastes could have stopped there. 
Why does he add, for this is all of man? What does he mean, for this is all of man? So Rabbi Elazar said that the implication of that verse is that God created the world ultimately and ideally for this kind of person, a person who lives in fear of God. Mm -hmm. And conversely, one could say, or additionally, the world continues to be sustained by virtue of the existence of some people at least, or one person at least, who lives in fear of heaven. That as long as there's one person who lives in fear of heaven, then the creation is maintained for his sake, for her sake. Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana said, the end of this verse teaches this is equivalent to the entire world. And Rabbi Shimon ben Azi says, not only is it equivalent to the entire world, but the entire world was created to serve as companions for him. So the existence of this one God-fearing person provides the rationale for the existence of all human society and all of physical creation. Hmm. Right? That seems to me to be a rather extraordinary piece of conversation. And what I'd like you to do for next week is to just uh, think about that and maybe if you can list what you think the implications are of that teaching. Right? The teaching that all of existence and all of human society is justified, as it were, for the person who lives in fear of God. What are all the ramifications of that idea? positive and maybe negative. And when we do that, when we get into that, we will see, I think, Jonathan, how even in this very, very small fragment of Talmudic material that is actually not going to be continued, but is going to lead us to another conversation when we look at the text next time, is embedded a treasure trove of, of, of Jewish spiritual um, content. Now, how that little piece of text and its spiritual content um, is related to this huge and, and, and oftentimes baffling text is still a question. But at the very least, we can see that it is um, that 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 that, that um, idea that these ideas are here. So, um, because we spent so much time on trying to get a little bit of an introduction, we didn't get as much time and experience in getting through the text. But um, hopefully, it's a beginning. All beginnings are a little difficult, but we've gotten off to a start. So I will look forward to seeing you next week and we will start with the text on the screen and we'll go from there. So have a good week, everybody, and see some of you who are in the Genesis class tomorrow. Yes. I'll see you in Genesis, Rabbi. It sounds like the name of a movie. <laughs> <laughs> you should come off. Thank you for letting yeah. me stay. Thank you. I hope, you'll, I hope you'll stay with us. I, I th I'm going to. I'm going to do the two classes. Okay, great. Have a good one, everybody. All right, man. Stay safe. You too. Yeah.